All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I am here with Robert Llewellyn of Fully Charged, um, and he is going to tell us some really interesting stuff about electric cars, I take it. <laughs> How are you, Robert? I'm very good. I'm very good. I'm, and I'm about as prepared as a uh, intoxicated rabbit, but I'll do my best because <laughs> it's sort of my, my bread and butter and my daily life. Um, I'll tell you the thing. Okay, here's one thing that I experienced this year. I was at a big motor show in the UK uh, 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 where there's lots of new cars on display and they had a big Tesla stand there and I didn't bother to go because I've seen Teslas. And then I went around, I saw the Polestar, the new car built by Volvo. Amazing. Uh, the the I-Pace, the Jaguar, uh, numerous brilliant conversions. Uh, and then I did eventually go and see the people at Tesla and I knew some of them. And there was a Model 3 uh, left-hand drive uh, registered in the, in the Netherlands. And I, I really, really didn't want to like it. I wanted to not be a Tesla fanboy and, and have a look at this car <laughs> that I'd never seen before and go, oh, my God. I just wanted to hate it. I wanted to think it was rubbish. And so I could get, then go, oh, well, Tesla have blown it. They really can't do it. They can't mass manufacture a car. It's just like no good. And I sat in it, and it is an absolutely brilliant car. It is so annoying. I was actually angry when I got out because <laughs> <laughs> I was so determined not to like it and to think it was a bit of a you know half-baked thing and not really there. It is genius. I mean, I sat, I didn't drive it. I sat in it for about 20 minutes with a representative from Tesla who showed me through all the controls on the screen. <sighs> it's just heartbreaking how good it is. And so I still have yet to drive it. Johnny Smith came to America early this year, who's my co-host on Fully Charged, and he drove it and has just raved about it ever since. He absolutely loved it. So that's quite annoying. <laughs> <'Cause> we, <laughs> it's quite annoying because we still can't get them in the UK, and who knows? Who knows when we'll be able to. Uh, yeah, and I just but, saw uh, that they're delivering or they're in Germany. And there's some in Munich and Barcelona yeah, and Lisbon. In, yeah, yeah. They get, they, they'll get them way before we will. Yeah, because we drive on the wrong side of the road. It's our own fault. We should, <laughs> should have learned that. Now. But uh, no, it was, it was great to see it. And, uh, and it is also, I mean, my, I've had a, a Model S now for uh, coming up to four years. And I absolutely love it. And I use it all the time. That my one complaint, and this is absolutely down to UK roads, is it's just a big car, and I really don't need a car that big. You know, that's the only criticism I can have of it, really. Mm -hmm. And so seeing the Model 3 being smaller um, was really interesting. But I think the thing that we've – the one car that I have to say stands out that we've just reviewed – I've just finished editing the review we've shot of it, which we shot over a long drive, uh, over 1,500 miles across uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, and France – earlier this year is the Hyundai Kona, hmm. uh, which is, which is truly, uh, it's as game changing, I think as, as Tesla have been, it's the first car that's come from a big manufacturer that you just, that, that is a mystery. We, we were mystified by how it did it. We're talking, we're talking a car that, that regularly gets five or over five miles to the kilowatt hour. You know, when you see the advertised range of a new electric car and you go, yeah, in the summer in the Netherlands, because it's very flat <laughs> with, no, with no wind, you know. But what was strange was we were driving in the Netherlands where it was very flat with no wind. So, you know, I think you would you would easily average over four miles to the kilowatt hour, which is still very good. And you're looking at a car that costs in UK money uh, around 30,000 pounds. So in dollars, say 35,000, 40, under $40,000, well under. <laughs> as, as of a, today. Yeah, as of today. In fact, now, 30,000 pounds. Let's not even talk about that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Outside the door of my studio, chaos reigns in this country. We have no idea what's going on. The, the only joy is, I'll do one thing about it. The, the one joy is most of my life I've been mystified by the intricacies of politics and arguments and I don't know which side I'm on and I don't know who to agree with and it's all very difficult to understand. And I'm now on, on a pl level playing field with the rest of the UK population. No one has a clue what's going on, <laughs> who's in charge, who to listen to. <laughs> you know, I... I 
I, I, I recently started listening to a, a uh, BBC report in the morning to give me kind of a sense, you know, as a as a kind of dumb American on like what the rest of the world has going on. And, uh, you know, I've been missing out. There is some really <laughs> interesting stuff happening. So it's going crazy here at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I, have, I mean, at the moment, I genuinely don't know who I, if we've got a prime minister or who it is. I think we've still got one, but I've not I've not I've avoided the news today because <laughs> it's just this morning it was so uh, utterly chaotic just yeah, everybody resigning and storming off in a huff yeah. it's all very funny <laughs> <laughs> and we'll all be yeah so thirty thousand pounds uh seven thousand dollars <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so sub forty thousand dollar car that really does do uh well over 280 miles on a charge a 62 kilowatt hour battery Wow. So really, really economic way of using power. It's front wheel drive. It's not a performance car. You know, uh, it, it, you can't, it's not fair to compare it with a sort of with a, you know, a, a tes- in terms of acceleration and all those sort of things, much less. But very respectable, very nippy car, really easy to park, to drive, got lot, all the gizmos inside that you could want, but done in a very traditional old school car way, lots of buttons and little flippy flappy things that come up and lots and lots of intricate knobs and things, you know, the absolute antithesis of a model three. <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, the sat nav when we were driving around the Netherlands was a little bit sporadic. Uh, there was one moment when Johnny was in the Kona, I was driving an I pace and there was a big freeway going straight ahead and a big turning off going over a bridge. And it was so obvious the way we were going was straight ahead. And I saw Johnny turn off over the bridge, <laughs> screaming at him on the walkie talkie. That's not the right way. <laughs> but the good thing was he had the range to get back to where we were because it wasn't a, a problem, you know. So, I mean, I was really impressed with that to such an extent that one is being delivered here on Tuesday morning. So I've leased wow. a, a, a Kona. There's very few around. That's the other big thing that we've really noticed is the demand in the UK, I can talk for the UK very confidently, the demand in the UK outstrips supply by years. There mm. are year-long waiting lists for many cars here, you know, the, uh, apart from the Model 3 Tesla. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a gr- there's a shortage. The one that you can get here very easily is the Renault Zoe. Uh, Renault mm-hmm. have managed to overcome their manufacturing problems. They, they're doing phenomenal business. They're really busy. In France, uh, Zoe is an incredible high-selling car. You know, that's really... Uh, yeah, and... Up. And the what about the I Pace? So because that's the I-Pace, an English yeah. car, right? Yeah, it's it's a, it's an English car designed and, and designed and conceived in England by an Indian owned company and built in Austria. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, but don't tell certain people in Britain that because they're very sure it's English. Um, but I, that all that aside, really, it is a brilliant car. I mean, from the point of view of a driving experience. It's on a, I'd say it's, you know, it's really difficult. I would say it's on a par with a a Tesla Model S, a performance Tesla Model S. If not, I'd say it's better built. Mm -hmm. It handles better. It it accelerates fractionally slower, I suppose, but not that you'd notice because it goes like stink. Um, Beautifully built, beautifully put together. It just feels like this really tight, beautifully made machine. It's, It's like driving. So the the comparison with the the Kona and the I Pace, which is the two cars Johnny and I were driving, the I Pace feels like you're driving a, an old V12 Jaguar with a mm. fabulous smooth running engine, beautiful bodywork, and it goes vroom, and it uses a lot of petrol. <laughs> and he was driving a Prius, <laughs> uh, you know. So his his go doesn't go as fast. It isn't as a performance car. It looks a bit naff, but it it go, just goes a hell of a long way on the same fuel. So the the best the best fuel efficiency I could get out of the I-Pace was two and a half miles to the kilowatt hour, and that mm. was trying hard. But the thing is, if we were filming the cars and Mark, the cameraman, was in front and he wanted me to pull over, overtake in the I-Pace, I would always overshoot it because I'd just put my foot down. The thing would rock it forward, even if we were going quite fast. It's, it's a very beautifully handling performance car, you know. It's a, mm-hmm. And I like the look of it. I think it looks great. It's really... Here's the good test for a man my age is if you do say you drive 150, maybe more miles in one stint on freeways and then you stop and you get out and you don't grunt. That is a really good sign. (laughs) When I get out of the Model S, because I've got it down, I'm sitting quite low in it. It takes me a while (laughs) 
to straighten up. There's a bit of, I, I suppress the grunting. I don't let it burst out. <laughs> but it, there is a sort of, <clears throat> as I get out of the car. I pace, just stood up, no problem. Really Fantas- comfortable car. Now. And, and, um, and the one thing that got me about the iPACE was the storage didn't seem to be that because people compare it to a Model X and the Model yeah. X, of course, has copious amounts. Oh, and to yeah. me, that was when I looked at the specs of it. I've never seen one. I, I hope to get in one maybe in December here. Uh, but but that was the one thing. So what do you think about the storage on that? Yeah, it's, I would I mean, if it isn't a smaller car, it should be because it feels much smaller inside. It's not as I mean, and that's not to say it's cramped. It's actually very comfortable and roomy. But it it it's uh, it's got to be a. I haven't what I haven't done is parked an, an I pace next to a Model X, mm-hmm. uh, and it feels like it is. It's considerably shorter. It feels narrower. It, you know, the Model X. To, when I drive the Model X, I one way. I, I live in a rural area. The if I turn right out of my front of my house. Both wing mirrors of the Model X were brushing both hedges at the same time, which is not a good feeling. <laughs> you know, it's really, really narrow lane, or it's a very wide Californian car. Uh, so the and the I pace has got to be a bit smaller. It's definitely not a roomy car to put stuff in. It's a pretty mm-hmm. tight car. I mean, I it's kind of on that weird cusp that Johnny always describes as a as a compact SUV. You know, it's that. Yeah, it's not. It's not a big roomy uh, car like that. So, I mean, we didn't have any trouble. We had a lot of bags in it, a lot of camera equipment. It wasn't a problem. But, I, you know, it's certainly not as big as a, a, a Model X. It's just a, a big mm-hmm. car. Yeah. Um, you know, and, I mean, it has it has a lot of similar features. You know, it has springy out door handles and it has four-wheel drive, two motors, uh, you, know, they, they, you know. And that side of it, the kind of – manufacturing of it is what is interesting to see because I'm not a, a, a car aficionado in that sense at all. I've just become very interested in electric vehicles, but even uh, with my slack <laughs> attitude to it, I could <laughs> sense just from the feel of the car, how tight it was, how solid it was. You want to, it's just when you go over a bump, it doesn't go, blah, 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 it goes, dump. you know, it's a really mm-hmm. tight, uh, tightly fitted together car. It felt very, very competent. And I don't know if you saw, we did a video where I drove one up a mountain in Portugal. And that was the biggest surprise for me was its off-road capability. So this is on road tires going up. It was, wasn't was muddy. It was dry dust and loose rock, very like a Californian hill. Mm-hmm. Actually, it reminded me a bit of California, southern Portugal, very hot. And it went up that hill that you could not walk up without assistance. You'd need sticks or a rope to pull yourself up really, really steep. We're like that angle. All I could see was the sky in front of me. And that car flew up that hill without any trouble at all, with no noise, no strain, wow. no revving and f- slipping clutches. It made funny noises It went because as each wheel lost grip, it would stop turning and it would apply it to the other one. So that kind of integration mm. of its drivetrain is exemplary. I mean, they've really done an amazing job. And they, of course, this was a press road test. They picked that route specifically right. to impress but my god it blew my mind because i've had uh, old land rover defenders in the past and driven them in stupid places that you shouldn't drive cars <laughs> and my land rover would have got up that slope but it would have made so much noise it would have burnt so much fuel i'd probably have burnt the clutch out you'd be thrashing the hell out of it to get it up whereas this was like no engine noise so it just goes and it would slip a bit interesting it just amazing that was extraordinary on road tires too yeah. And so the Kona, though, you're actually getting delivered. Yes. So I've started leasing a Kona. We've traded, we've got finally, finally, it's taken far too long. And it's my wife's uh, what, a lack of interest in vehicles. And why should she be interested? None, <laughs> no reason at all. She's an intelligent, sensible woman. But she, when I was at a conference recently in, actually, again in Portugal, and uh, she came with me because we had a weekend away. It was very nice. And uh, while I was talking in the conference, you know, I thought she'd gone off to an art gallery. But what she actually did was have a test drive in the Kona, which they had there. <laughs> uh, Amazing. Which she did on herself. My wife has never, ever shown any interest in <laughs> test driving anything. But she took this car out and was in hysterics because it's not called the Kona in Portugal. For uh, some viewers may speak Portuguese and they'll know why. But it's, that's a, it's a very, very bad word in Portuguese. Uh. It's, it's it's the bad word you don't say, even on British television. 
<laughs> and so it's in, it's called something I I can't remember though. It's a Japanese word which means elf or fairy or something. It's like the kyunye <laughs> or something like that. But nice. I didn't know this, so I was on stage going. I was really impressed with the new Hyundai Kona. Audience went very quiet and looked a bit awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I just stood in front of 350 people and used a bad word. I, didn't know. I, don't. <laughs> I thought only um, us Puritans over here in the States were the ones that are afraid of bad words like that. Yeah, well, you know, it, is the, it is the sort of the most extreme. Actually, to say people, the people do use it on British television, but not hmm. very often. Yeah. <laughs> we Fair enough. So then you'll have the Model S and that? Those will be yes, your. Have Model S. I've got. I've still got in my old Nissan Leaf, which I've just. I've toyed with trading in. So we're sorry. We're trading in a very old uh, plug-in Prius, which uh, my mm. wife's had for I don't know how long. Ten, five, uh, whenever, whenever it came out, which she hates, and she hates buying petrol. So now she's very happy about um, having the Kona. So she's really got the Kona is sort of hers, although I'm slightly annoyed about that, and I might try and. <laughs> <laughs> try and use it more than she does but uh yeah and then and we've but i've still got a nissan leaf which you know is stupid having three cars i think it's ridiculous but somehow now the, <laughs> the nissan leaf is basically a free car i've had it so long it's so bit dented and scratched it's not been very well looked after but it still runs we use i've used it twice today we use it every day it had lousy range when i got it back in 2011 it's got lousy range now so nothing much <laughs> has changed <laughs> Fantastic. And so you'll keep you'll so you'll have all those and what'll be your so you'll drive the Model S on a daily? Well yeah, I've got the Model S until June. Again, it's on a lease and, mm -hmm. and my name is down with the lease company I work with uh for a Model 3. So they've ordered I think it's 400 Model 3s. Yeah. I don't know when and they don't know when they're going to get them. And so as soon as they get one, I I will you know, I'm on the the top of their list to to have sure. one. So you know, so I'm assuming not before June. I, I have yeah, no idea. Probably not, but but they Elon was just saying that they should start to deliver to Europe in Q1, and I yeah, think I, you guys would get them shortly thereafter, right? Because they need to make the right-hand drive ones. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Why don't we drive on the right side of the road? It's here. <laughs> places I find really easy to drive, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, those old colonies drive yeah. on the correct side like, unlike you lot who got all stroppy <laughs> no I, I love it I, I took a friend um, for a drive one time and he's uh, from New Zealand and I let him drive my Model S and that was scary for both of us because <laughs> right. to, yeah. to him making a right hand turn was so weird um, yeah. you know and but here of course that's normal to us so um, that's amazing yeah. I, and admit, so, I don't I, I don't find it hard to because I drive in Europe a lot so I'm very yeah. used to driving on the on the left hand side so it doesn't it doesn't uh, I mean driving on the right beg your pardon and it, uh, the, uh, one thing I remember driving in Los Angeles when the route showed that I had to make a right hand turn uh, sorry a left hand turn I, I used to get nervous about that so I would go around the block I'd do a right then a right <laughs> then a right <laughs> so you just do rights <laughs> yep yep that's uh i think ups does that the delivery service because oh, really? it, it, oh. it turns out some data geeks like like me did some some maths and we looked at it and we said if you only make right hand turns when you're delivering stuff you'll save a few million miles yeah. of driving time and gas right. and fuel and everything else so because you're waiting so i've waited for hours sometimes trying to turn left. <laughs> yeah it, it can be bad yeah you're right or maybe i was being really intelligent then as opposed to a bit, a bit <laughs> A bit chicken. <laughs> either way, either way. Now, um, what else do you have going on out there? Because I, I feel like 2018 was a big year for electric cars. The Model 3 yeah. probably being the big thing actually coming to life uh, in, yeah. in, in full. What do you see on the horizon? Do you see, I mean, is 2019 just, are we going to skip 2019? And 2020, you have all the German automakers coming out with stuff. Like where, yeah, what's, no. what's coming I mean, up I, in the I, near no, term a, that you a, see? A huge amount of electric cars coming out in Europe generally and here as well in 2019. I mean, really a lot. So... Uh, we've seen them all recently. The the uh, uh, Audi e-tron, the uh, Mercedes EQ mm, something or other. I can't remember. <laughs> yep. the there's about there's about uh, there's a lot of um, sort of I pace size compact SUV electrics. 
the the uh, e-tron is really interesting it'll be the first production car without wing mirrors it's got uh, cameras uh, which with with uh, screen oh. settings and, and we haven't we've sat in it and looked and it kind of works but until you drive it you can't really tell um we're in fact driving that uh, before christmas johnny's uh, test driving that um volkswagen uh, there's some bits about the of volkswagen news that i've been party to that i'm not allowed to repeat but they are seriously big bigly big time doing electrics <laughs> and, and a lot and, and a couple of those will be released in 2019 but on a scale that we can't we can't really envisage until they're actually doing it yeah the, the, the investment they're putting into battery technology into electric drivetrains is you know it's it's what tesla have spent in its lifetime right right <laughs> they're, they're spending this year you know so they're <laughs> really because they've got no they've realized they've they're either going to go out of business their sales have been really taken a hammering, particularly in Europe with diesel, uh, yep. you know, the diesel scandal. Um, you know, so that is, I think they're doing some really interesting stuff. Uh, uh, um, and, and, Aston and what Martin, do you think? So, so yeah. the high-end Porsche, Aston Martin, obviously Jag, um, McLaren. There's all sorts of people bringing out stuff. And then in this country, what the big story really is Dyson, the mm. vacuum cleaner maker they they have you know we know they're making electric car they're not saying anything about it i know i've driven past where they're testing it and it's very yeah. carefully shielded uh <laughs> but it was interesting on the day they announced they were going to manufacture them in singapore a swedish company landed who are called unity who are really cool uh did a press conference we attended where they're going to build their cars in the uk which <laughs> Yeah, then anyway. and with i mean it, touching on the political stuff that we don't want to dive too deep into but that yeah. actually does pose an interesting challenge because then they would have to import them to europe if they were selling them in europe right and potentially uh, tariffs or i don't know what the rules are going to be i mean no. I don't, who well, knows you, but I mean, you don't yeah you don't need to know because you can be rest assured that no one else knows uh, anywhere <laughs> in the world no one's got but, a clue Even really well-paid politicians and and civil servants <laughs> <They're just> going, <laughs> what <laughs> yeah. because so that that is a really interesting thing then about uh, manufacturing something in the UK and, and what challenges they, they may face yeah. there. Well, I, I wonder what the thinking was behind that. But um, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I felt kind of, um, you know, I, I definitely think the German automakers are are becoming aware, <laughs> I guess yeah. is a way to put it. Yeah. But I, I definitely felt like the ones I saw recently, whatever, you know, the EQC from Mercedes, the yeah. uh, uh, e-tron, um, and then, the, I mean, the Aston Martin thing, I don't count because that's kind of a luxury, very limited, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. But all of those, and then BMW had something too, right? The iVision or something like that. Uh, yes. All yeah. of those seemed a little half-hearted to me. It, it seemed like, yeah. yes, it's good that they're making steps in the right direction. But my, my thinking was, if you're releasing a car in 2020 that only gets as much mileage as my 2013 Tesla, yeah. you're, you're kind of, uh, you're, you're missing it. Like, m maybe that's just, is that just what they can do at now at the time but then those investments will pay off so in 2022 they'll have a car that goes 400 miles like what do you yeah. think i mean there I has mean, to be to, something right yeah i mean i think that's the thing and that's why why the hyundai stands out yeah is that the things like the e-tron as you say the mercedes are of 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 the moment i mean uh, now they're about like at the higher end of of range but they're also at the higher end of cost you know so they're, they're right. equivalent cost of a model s with almost the same range. We don't know yet because I haven't driven them, but, you know, we're guessing somewhere close to, you know, they've similar sized batteries, similar sized cars. Uh, and that's where the Hyundai really stands out, a car that's half the price with the same range. So I think if you're looking at that, and that is, I think, what we're going to see Honda in particular mm -hmm. uh, and Volkswagen are going to bring out um, sub $30,000 cars. I mean, and I mean majorly sub without government subsidies majorly under $30,000 cars with 200 mile ranges. Uh, yeah. And that's where I think we'll see the, the and they're, they're huge companies that can produce hundreds of thousands of cars as opposed to, you know, a, a limited run of 150s luxury <laughs> sedans, you know, which is, there's a lot of that. I mean, there's a lot of greenwash, hogwash. And I think the, 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 the two companies I can see that will, 
that are big enough to really mass produce cars honda and uh the honda urban ev which they've only revealed the prototype of but they've gone into production with and that's coming out next year is a small hatchback so golf or even slightly smaller than uh, what do you call the golf in um the states is called the rabbit no the hair no, yeah a name. yeah i think what we call it the golf or uh the td t- tdi or something like that yeah, i forget that yeah small hatchback uh, yeah BMW. so that sort of scale a bit smaller than that but with a 200 mile range which is i you know for me a 200 mile range is the kind of uh when people say i've got range anxiety i'll I would then say, drive this car for a week and, and then shut up about it because you don't <laughs> need rent checks out. You'll charge it once a week because actually people don't, particularly in this country, we drive 25 to 30 miles a day. That's yeah. the massive, massive, av- the vast majority of journeys are that long. Well, that's four or five days driving in an electric right. car. So you don't charge it every day and panic about it and constantly looking for chargers as people imagine who've never driven one, you know, so that's, whereas in a Nissan, in my old Nissan Leaf, if I drive 10 miles, I'm looking for a charger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I come, you know, I, I was in Hawaii recently and I rented a Kia soul EV. It right. was this little, t- uh, hamster toaster thing. And yeah. I think it had, I, it, I, it actually had, I think 120 miles or so, 130 yeah, it, maybe. It probably would do, it would do around 120. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, at first I'm coming in from a uh, model three with 310 miles yeah. <laughs> thinking, Oh man, what am I going to do? But when you get there, the whole island I was on, I was on Kauai, it's only 30 miles around. So yeah. I could do a couple laps in this yes. without even having to, yeah. to worry. Um, yeah. So I think you're right. You know, Now, this brings up another topic I'm really curious your thoughts on is um, the guys at Edmonds did a, a roundtable discussion recently where they had a Nissan Leaf, um, whatever the current version is, that gets 150 miles, and Model 3, and I forget what the other one was. Um, maybe it was the Kona. But but the two, the, the, the question was, how much range do you actually need in, a via, in, yeah. in an electric car? And one of the guys was arguing, well, 150 miles is beyond what 99% of people will drive in a day. So that's it. That's all you need. Um, my, my position on that was more of, well, if we truly want electric cars to replace gas cars in all ways, then it needs to get further or at least on par with a, you know, whatever common like Honda Civic, something like that. So I don't know, like, do we need a 400 mile range electric car or is 150, 200 mile enough? Like, what do you think for the, for the future? It's uh, there's something about for me from, and this is purely from my personal experience, but having a car that will do more than 200 miles or 200 miles plus it, I, it, it is so then a journey isn't a consideration. I mean, particularly in Europe, there's a charging infrastructure that is annoying but adequate. You know, it's not mm-hmm. enough. It, it, it would be great if there was more. It would be great if the chargers were faster. It would be great if some particular chargers were more reliable. But on the whole, once you get used to doing it, it's actually not a problem at all. Yeah, for instance, driving the I-Pace around the UK was, I didn't think about it, it was really easy. Yeah. But, and then once we got to, particularly the Netherlands, it, it, there was, uh, you know, it just, their, their charging infrastructure is, it should be a world standard. It's exemplary, you know, it's really, <laughs> really good. And, and they have 175 kilowatt CCS chargers. Wow. So actually, technically faster than superchargers. I mean, there's no cars available yet. The the iPace will take 100. I think it was taking slightly over 100 kilowatts. So it was charging twice as fast as a, a Chadamo or C, normal CCS. Mm-hmm. And it was really noticeable. It was much, much quicker to charge. Um, but the, I, I think, you know, 200 miles, people would get used to it very quickly. Uh, yeah. You know, even if you were kind of going, oh, well, I've got to drive to, you know, I think, I think, countries like australia and the united states it's more of a challenge because even in with my limited experience of of living and working in america i have driven thousands of miles <laughs> <laughs> across across ludicrous deserts and you know nevada and new yeah. mexico i mean and yeah. that was that was you know work connected but the very fact that that was even 
considered a plausible or, or, or possibility yeah that you're in a car for so you're gonna how long will it ta- how long will it take us to get there about 10 hours there's nowhere in this country in my, where i live <laughs> you can drive 10 hours you're going to go into the sea you can't drive that <laughs> you could dr- drive up to edinburgh and back a couple back, times yeah. right <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean you know it's just crazy so so that is where that is a different challenge i think uh, you know so if you right yeah, and that that is a fair enough anxiety you know you let say you live in Seattle, I don't know, Oklahoma City, somewhere, and you yeah. drive every day to work, and you are doing 30, 40 miles, but then you go and see relatives who live 1,300 miles away, that's, yeah. that's, and you're going to drive with the kids in the car, which yeah. I can't believe people do, but I know people do do it, and I, you know, I've been on those sort of journeys. Same and in every- Australia. Yeah. Every year I go back, so I'm in San Diego and I go back to Phoenix, Arizona, and oh. that's about 400 miles. Right. Um, and I was driving my 2013 Model S with a top range of 200, but of course you don't get 200. Yeah. Um, and so I would have to stop three times at superchargers. So even though I have really great infrastructure, really fast yeah. charging, with my two-year-old in the back, he is not very understanding no. <laughs> of these kind of things. Um, so this year we have our Model 3 with 310 miles. So we'll stop once and right. that, that'll that be it. Um, right. So yeah, I mean, it, I think you're right. Yeah, that makes sense. So if I was in, I don't know, Paris and I needed to go somewhere, yeah, 200 miles is probably yeah. fine everywhere you're going if, and if there is a charging infrastructure i think i mean i think it's going to be down the, it's quite interesting the kind of general attitude to electric cars here amongst the general public who don't drive them who aren't interested in cars or anything but the people i speak to regularly who either come to talks i do or who see talk to me in car parks where i'm getting yeah. out the car you know it happens a lot and uh and it used to always be, oh, well, you have to throw the batteries away or the <laughs> electricity is dirtier than diesel or all those things, you know, or I'm, or I'm worried about the range. I no, don't get any of those comments now. I get, well, there's no chargers. Huh. There's no charging infrastructure. And then I show them, I've got a, there's a, a really good app in the UK called ZapMap, which is, uh, you know, an app on your phone, which just shows you where all the chargers are. And I just say, look, that's us here. And I zoom out a bit and there's, 5,000 charge yeah. points within 20 miles. And they go, oh, my God. <laughs> now, I, but I don't go into the granular detail uh, because some of those are seven kilowatt chargers. You know, yeah. you'd have to be there for a long time. There are one or two rapid chargers that are colored red with a cross on. They're not working. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, you can get, you could get into a granular description. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's still an emerging thing. But we've now got just we've just seen the first few of these which is all i want in chargers is you go to you park in front of the charger there it is it's got ccs it's got chadamo you walk up to it with your debit card or credit card you go beep on the screen you put plug your car in it starts charging you pay for it yes but you don't do anything else you're not a member you haven't got a special tag you don't have a card you don't do anything you haven't got a special app you pay for it like you pay for a a loaf of bread or a liter of milk you know right and uh uh, sorry quart of milk (laughs) uh what do we say a gallon half gallon Gallon. yeah yeah yeah. i have once bought a gallon of milk and that made me so happy (laughs) well you know i think that's a very good point because um yeah, not all chargers are created equal, and when it comes to the public charging, it is such a hassle uh, yeah. with memberships and key fobs and et cetera, et cetera, uh, and especially in, like in the United States where you know this is a giant country. So if I'm going on a road trip, I may come into a town that has a charging network I've never seen before. I'm happy to pay for it, but I look, I need to charge right now. I don't have time to go visit an office or whatever the, you know, I need to do. Yeah. So I think I think that that, that that's a, a really good point. Now, this brings up another topic that that I had some I'm curious your thoughts on is uh charge point um other than now I guess they're bought by BP, which is a weird thing, but okay. Okay. Uh, oh, charge uh, master. Yeah, charge master in this country. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. The, yeah, so there, these charge, are the yeah, yeah, the the charging networks. They announced that they're gonna they're gonna install something like 2.5 million public chargers in the next I don't know 10 years or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And my, my question to you was, uh, so these are level two chargers. There will be some level threes, but yeah. in general, that they're, they're the level twos. Uh, is that necessary? Um, if we have a car in five years 
that can go 400 miles and that maybe maybe let's say 300 miles becomes standard within yeah. five years for an electric car yeah which do, i think it will yeah, yeah do we need 2.5 more million more public charging spaces or are people just going to pretty much always charge at home because you never need to charge when you're out and about i mean i think the thing is so the the most recent experience I've had around this area is there's a uh, Oxford is a, uh, about 40 miles from where I live and there's a big new shopping mall uh, in Oxford that's really only opened in the last year I think so loads of big new shops and cinemas and restaurants and all that and in the in the uh, down on the underneath is a, a car park big modern car park and there are 64 uh, uh, type 2 charge points 7 kilowatt charge points uh, it just they're not, they're just sockets on, uh, on the on the concrete posts. So you just park your car. It's got no. It isn't painted green. It isn't electric cars only. It's just car parking space. But there's so many of them. Yeah. That you, if you find a space there, you can plug your car in. Well, you don't pay for the charging. You just plug your car and it starts charging. Uh, you pay for the parking, and obviously you're shopping in the thing. Well, I would never go to that place normally. It's just not what I do. But I've actually now arranged three meetings that I've had <laughs> where people have come from London. I said, I'll meet you in Oxford at this place. There's lovely, there's very nice new restaurants on the top floor. So I've had lunch meetings with people. The car's <laughs> charging all the time I'm there. I'm not waiting for it. I'm not right. doing anything else. I'm not going anywhere else. You know, we've done a thing where we've met a load of mates there, gone to the cinema, had a meal. When we got back in the car, it was full in the Model S because it had been there for five hours. And yeah. It just filled, and it wasn't empty when we got there, but, you know, it filled up. And you just go, wow, that's so cool. And now there's been three occasions where I've driven 40 miles into Oxford, plugged the car in, blah, 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 lunch, blah, 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 shopping, buy some socks, get back in the car, drive home. And I've had 10 miles more range when I've got home than I had when I left. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that feels like a plus. But what I'm saying is that that grazing charging so not it's much cheaper to put in than rapid chargers it, 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 to make that ubiquitous which is i think what charge master are talking about that it isn't a big deal you go to a supermarket car park you park there for an hour two hours you add 10 20 30 miles range to your car and if you don't have anywhere which is about 40 percent of uk households don't have off street parking or anywhere to charge to park a car or you know on their own property which is quite a big chunk of people well those people will really appreciate that noticeable amount of charging so i think you know there's there's no, there's no perfect solution but i think that will it's, it's something i really enjoy doing yeah. the, the, the the proliferation of tesla destination charges in fact yesterday i had a lunch meeting in a hotel about 60 miles away from here and i was there for maybe four hours well the car was charging all the time i was there and yeah. that's what i think is you know if you can get to the point where we all know that 90 percent of the time our cars aren't in use that really is enough time to charge them right <laughs> and, and that and that, uh, that infrastructure is relatively cheap to install and there's electricity everywhere so if people get used to that so that you go in a, a multi-story big car park in a city and every single car space has a socket not just yeah. one or two in the corner with green leaves painted on like in oslo i mean oslo has numerous car parks now with you know there's ten thousand car parking spaces and there's eight thousand charge points right right <laughs> uh, you know i think that becomes a, a and, and also workplace charge points that's really growing here very rapidly people are putting them in to like where people go to work so the the kind of uh, omnipresence of charging stations yeah. and I will think a lot of them will, and what people will discover really soon is a lot of them won't be used and right. even now you know there's a we've had a, a really in, uh, impressive increase in the number of electric cars on the uk roads i mean the the sales of electric cars have gone up and the sales of diesel cars have fallen off a cliff which is a hugely good bit of news yeah in an otherwise bleak landscape but the but the amount that rapid charges on the motorways and rapid charges are used it has gone up fractionally, but not much because people don't use them that much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're in they're in use like four or five percent of the of a day. They're being used. Well, that's nothing. You know, there's an enormous capacity there, and and it's so hard to. You know, I think it's it's a, a pain we've got to go through to explain to people you you'll use it much less than you think. Right. You know, the, the, it's much less common. Yeah. I and mean, I probably use superchargers, 
you know, and I probably am a, I reckon I'm a heavy user three or four times a month. I will actually stop at a supercharger to charge. That's a lot. Most of the time it's, it's charged here or it's charged in a car park where I park it for, you know, a day uh, if I'm working somewhere, you know, and it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Char- it's, it's low charging. So it's a, yeah, I mean, it's a combination of all of them. To, but, to that I mean, point, my car right now is at a garage uh, car park at, across the street from my building in a destination charger. Um, there are superchargers there as well, but I'm yeah. going to be here all day. And so, you know, I don't need the superchargers. So that's perfect, isn't it? I mean, that's the thing. I mean, that's the, yeah, that's one, one side of it. I mean, the other thing that I'm, I'm obsessed with is, which is just this amazing little gizmo I've got in my just through that wall behind me is is my car and there's a, we've got a thing called a Zappy charger and it's really simple technology basically I have solar panels on the roof up there and <clears throat> during this the UK summer when we've had a very good one this year <laughs> it's quite unusual uh, you know I've got Tesla power wall uh, 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 solar water heating you know that the, the, all these things that just take power from the solar panels but once the water's hot and the power walls full it automatically switches and charges the car and huh. if, uh, it's mostly the leaf i charge on it but that has done you know six seven thousand miles this year for zero money wow <laughs> which i think is you know the fact that you can do that and i don't kind of go through oh i've got to remember to switch over or i must plug it in now it's plugged in it won't start charging until there's enough juice coming from the panels and so often it's the sort of second half of the arch of the the solar day it goes it's like filling batteries heating water da, da, and then it just everything's full and it immediately switches to the car and it will it can i mean very often the leaf is full at the end of a sunny day when yeah it was in the morning so it's uh you know that and that as that stuff becomes more common you know and I, that's the thing that really got me kind of obsessed with it was i've had all sorts of cars over the years and i've never been able to refine my own petrol in my own house, <laughs> you know, I've got about. I've got to have an. I, I'd have one if I could get away with having an oil rig in my garden. I'd have one and an oil <laughs> refinery, but it's quite a big ask. And so now I'm actually producing the fuel I use to drive a car on the roof of my house uh, with yeah with, with zero effort. You know, I'm curious. Have you ever, uh, you know, before we kind of battery electric vehicles won? Um, did you ever look at biodiesel? Uh, not, no, not, it, it, I, because I think because I live in a farming area, so I don't yeah. know a lot of farmers around here. I mean, they, they talked about it here. I mean, there was certainly a period of time uh, a few years ago, they stopped doing it now where they were growing oil seed for biofuel. Yeah. And they were getting good price for it. And and so all the fields around here in, in sort of uh, uh, April, May, were this incredible, beautiful color, incredible yellow color, really like chromium yellow with all the flowers of the oil seed. It has an unfortunate, it, it, uh, it's the common term for it is rape, R-A-P-E. <laughs> it's, so, uh, and so my brother and I, when we were kids, would run through those fields going, we're running through rape, because we thought <laughs> rape was a rude word, which shows our innocence uh, back in the 1960s. <laughs> but um, so it's commonly referred to as oil seed rape, but I just, it's better to call it oil seed. Um, yeah. Uh, and, but that's, they've stopped that. And I mean, I think I never went through it. I mean, I had a, my, a diesel Land Rover until about 10 years ago and that, uh, it was just running on diesel. And there were people who said, oh, you should change it to run on right. biodiesel. But right. I, when, I used to do this series called Junkyard Wars, Scrap Heap Challenge. Uh, it was on the Discovery Channel in the States, uh, Junkyard Wars. But we did quite a few challenges where people would use biodiesel engines uh, for crazy road trips in crazy floating cars, all sorts of daft stuff. Right. But I remember following one and the smell, it just smelled like, when you've left the, a pan on the stove with oil in it and it's burning the oil, it smells like that. Like, God, that just smells like all it made. It just made me anxious. Made, Take the pan off. You're burning the oil. <laughs> so it wasn't, and it was very smoky, cleggy yeah. smell coming out the back of it. I mean, I think it's what the Brazilians have done is is remarkable. You know, they, but but you think wouldn't it be better to use that land to grow food for human beings rather yes. than biofuel? <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, very and I know clearly. There's alternatives, and there's cellular stuff, and there's all kinds of agricultural waste that can be used for. Uh, it's I just got I've just got the suspicion it's a in a sense like hydrogen, right? I mean, I prefer hydrogen because 
when you use the fuel in a fuel cell, it's very, very, it's a very clean process. And when you burn biodiesel in a diesel engine, it's a very inefficient and dirty process and you are releasing toxins into the air, you know, so I think I'm not a big fan. Yeah. Talk to me about the hydrogen fuel cells, because uh, it seemed like that was really hot or interesting. Toyota and Honda, I think we're pushing it yeah. for a little while, but it seems like either they backed off or I've, you know, my, my feed is so put me in a bubble that all I see yeah. is battery stuff. It's very difficult. I mean, I think the areas that I can see, uh, genuine sort of commercial potential for hydrogen fuel cells are uh, uh, basically large vehicles, yeah. trains. There's a couple of trains. There's a train going to start running in the UK soon that is hydrogen. There is one already running in Germany that is running on hydrogen fuel cells very effectively. Uh, you know, they have the infrastructure next to the rail lines that can produce the the hydrogen. Yeah. Uh, and they can store it there on a kind of bulk level. And this this is they're very keen to point out this is hydrogen that's using electricity to split water from wind turbines. So it's not there's no fossil fuel in them in the mix. Right. It's not uh, it's not um, steam reclaimed natural gas where, where you get hydrogen out of that. Uh, and also it's when you're making a large, heavy fuel cell, you can use a lot less expensive materials it's a much cheaper piece of machine so i think ships trains buses that we went on a hydrogen fuel cell coach in uh, south korea earlier this year which was amazing i mean yeah. really really impressive it was like going from a petrol car to a tesla this was like going from you know, going <laughs> from a diesel bus to a hydrogen bus that thing went like stink it was so quiet because you really couldn't hear anything you're sitting yeah. in a kind of luxury you know huge cabin this is a big coach too not a little mini bus a big thing and it went up the mountain you just couldn't hear it you could just hear sort of air it was just phenomenal it yeah was really it, it, power of it and that, that had a does, seven, 750 mile range on one wow tank of hydrogen you know so very usable long distance travel bus yeah that, that makes a lot of sense it seems that the technology of the hydrogen fuel cells is good like the the physics of how it all works makes a lot of yeah. sense you have really high energy density cells and all that but as a consumer product I, it I seems i can't ever see it working i mean i'd love to be proved wrong because i think however the arguments go between battery electric and hydrogen if the world was just battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell cars it would be such a massive improvement. That's yeah. why I won't, I, I, I'm always hesitant to slag off hydrogen fuel cell cars because I think, yeah, okay, there's loads of problems. And, and obviously the fossil fuel industry are very keen on it because they can still sell us hydrogen in a what looks like a gas pump. And it is, yeah. you know, and there's, you know, there's lots of problems with it. Very complicated vehicles. They would need a lot more servicing than a battery vehicle. The filters needed to clean the air to put it in the, fuel cell the, the air that goes into the fuel cell has to be incredibly clean which is why they always talk about the air how clean the air is that comes out but they don't really go into detail <laughs> about how much they've got to do to get the air in because if there's any particulates in the air fuel cell will clog up in in um, hours and not work so yeah. it's got to be crystal clear air that goes in and then it's just air and, and water that comes out you know so there's all those problems but if we had less diesel cars on the road then the air would be cleaner anyway <laughs> <laughs> so I love the idea that there are manufacturers who are making diesel cars that chuck out all this filth and then they make hydrogen cars that have to filter that air that's come out of the cars they built <laughs> in order to run their hydrogen cars. But yeah. We we've come full circle some full circle there. Yeah. That's yeah. great. There was a question here about the shoes in your background. <laughs> and I haven't heard this, so I'm oh, kind I'll of wondering that. too. I'll hold it up. So that is a shoe, uh, it's hard to see. I mean, it's not, it, if you look closely, it's not very well. I used to make shoes. So that was the first shoe I made my, for myself. Really? In 19, uh, 19, I think that was 1976. I wow. made that. It's a, a, a British Oxford brogue. Yep. I, I have a, and I have a pair of Allen Edmonds that look identical to that. Right. <laughs> but they were, yeah, they were handmade. And that leather, there is a story behind that leather. I'll do it as quickly as I can, was carried out of Russia before the Soviet uh, revolution of 1917. Uh, a Russian shoemaker brought a whole roll of, of uh, Russian calf over. It's, it's so bizarre. And I basically used offcuts to make those shoes 
of wow. this exquisite, exquisite. It was like silk, this leather. It was extraordinary. I mean, that's it's old, and they've, I've worn them a lot. They've done a lot of service. I can't, I can barely wear them now. They're much too tight. You know, my yeah. feet have expanded. So I was sort of. <laughs> Nineteen twenty, when I built uh, about nineteen or twenty years old when I built them, but yeah. So I used to be a bespoke shoemaker. I was an apprentice in London in the seventies. It really feels like <laughs> like I'm talking about Dickensian London now. You know, so. but in fact, the, the company that I work for are still there. So the two companies I work for are still still trading. Oh, uh, that's fantastic! They make, they make Prince Charles's shoes. John Lobbs, they're called, and the and the Queen's riding boots they used to make. I don't think she does riding anymore, but yeah, they did do them. <laughs> so, well, 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 while you mentioned the the Queen, I have a short thing. I think I got it. I think Dan, uh, who I think you work with, helped me yeah. understand this. Okay, so if you are the in line for the crown, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so Prince, uh, Prince Charles, Charles, yeah, yeah, he is the Prince of Wales. Currently, yes. Uh, b- and and why, like, that doesn't make sense? Because Wales technically is a different country? Uh, well, it's – oh, God. I mean, you're really asking <laughs> me because it's now this, – all this stuff so contentious. So technically, it's not a different country. It's part of the United Kingdom. Okay. Which is confusing because we've got a queen, but we're not allowed to call it United Queendom. Okay. <laughs> uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, there was a wonderful drag club in London in the 1970s called the United Queendom. <laughs> but we won't go there. Uh, I just thought it was a great, a great name for a club. Um, uh, so they're not a separate country. Uh, they have their own devolved parliament, Wales do, as do Scotland and right. as did Northern Ireland. So it's really, oh, I mean, the British Constitution is a, is a, a real hodgepodge. So, it's uh, kind of developed over literally a thousand years and it's yeah. loads of compromises and wars and God knows what. Yeah. So my my name is very Welsh. So three of my grandparents were from Wales, one, uh-huh. one, from, one from London. And uh, so, you know, it's in my heritage, uh, that side of it. But I, I can't speak Welsh and I can't even pretend to do a Welsh accent I'm really bad at it <laughs> which my relatives would be appalled at <laughs> but, uh, but yeah so yeah I don't know I can't remember now there was a time when I was at primary school when I knew why he was made the Prince of Wales but I can't really remember so, someone told uh, me it was some king I don't know which one um, an, an English king that wanted to kind of throw a bone to the Welsh people yeah, yeah, right, and, and like say that. hey okay so if you're prince we're going to make you the Prince of Wales so that way Wales is still like a part of the thing I don't know yeah. anyway sorry for the, the side no, no, it's, it's I, I, to... I have a friend that's actually uh emigrating um he's he's moving to london um he has a visa he's going to live there for a few years and so me and him over lunch always have chats about all this kind of wild stuff so (laughs) that was a question i I was like wait a minute how how does this work because that's one of the things that we've come across recently is a couple of friends of ours have had to do this the sort of british nationality like you would in america if you were yeah uh, nationalized if you were becoming a citizen of the united states you have to know about the constitution and about right. you know all those things and and the same thing is happening here but the thing that we all know is if you asked me or anyone else who was born here raised here went to school here we would we would score so low on that test <laughs> really humiliating we wouldn't have a clue who's yeah. the queen of england oh i know this don't tell me she's a lady <laughs> she wears hats she likes horses <laughs> don't, don't piss her off yeah, yeah. <laughs> i don't know he's a bloke <laughs> uh, did you know, did you notice at the uh, I don't know if you saw any of that or whether you heard the story at the royal wedding that we had this this year mm-hmm. with Kate Middleton and whatever prince he was a lovely prince with he's a bit bald a bit like his dad <laughs> that um, was a few years ago they have kids was that, now was that last year oh yeah yeah you're Sorry, thinking yeah, not this year last year <laughs> but when they left the wedding in an E type jag. Yeah, you, that was that know? was this year that was Harry and uh, Harry. I don't yeah and and an American girl. Oh, was it them that went in the E-type? God, yeah. I'm getting really confused. Okay, but then, do you know about the E-type? Did you yes, know that? yeah. That, oh, right. that was so, so that was a classic 
Jag that was remade as an electric car, which it's confusing to me that it's called the, the E-Type is not actually the electric No, but it's <laughs> version. the perfect, because that's what I said to Jaguar. Why well, you call it the I-Pace, you should call it the E-Type. It's obviously the E-Type, you know, it's the yeah. new E-Type. Right, yeah. right, because yeah, the yeah, F-Type. beautifully done, that car. The way they converted that was, and they're now doing lots of classic Jags. They can, I mean, I think that is one of the most exciting things that's coming out of yeah. Basically having enough electric cars that some of them get wrecked and you can get the batteries out. Uh, we've just done a show with a guy in Amsterdam who's doing amazing conversions of classic yeah. cars, but also boats and speedboats and ships. I mean, he's there because they've got – there is a, a certain tonnage of batteries that's coming out of Norway after each winter because <laughs> people in Norway slide their cars into things, you know, because it's very slippery. Yeah, he, said, yeah. I, I, he said, I love Norway. It's a really slippery country. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just Teslas. I mean, it's Leafs. It's Zoe. So they're getting all these wrecked cars, and they're not like blown up, and you know, they, right. they just smash the front in. They're, they're written off as cars, but the batteries are fine. The motors are fine. He's got he's got tons of it. You know, there's yeah. and there's people doing the most incredible conversion. I've seen a couple recently of cars in the states, uh, beautiful or sort of nineteen forties. Yeah, amazing. And I can't remember what it's called, but amazing looking thing. There's a company nearby me, actually. It's maybe about 20 miles north of me um, in between San Diego and Los Angeles and um, called EV West. And they do these. Oh, man, they do such brilliant stuff. No, well, I mean, I will be in touch because there is some there is some uh, 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 fully charged american activity Ooh, happening next yes year. yes <laughs> all right let's let's get uh we've taken a good amount of time i have one question oh, yeah. from somebody here and then um we'll just after this question we'll wrap up with anything you have going on what's next where can people find you you know i know you guys right. said fully charged live so anything else coming out so this question comes from pablo loho um any idea how autonomous cars behave when crossing the border from left side driving country mm. uh, Ooh, what a autopilot, brilliant question. Autopilot, pro yeah. yeah that, well, I mean, the only place, that uh, the only two places I know of where that would be conceivably possible, and it's kind of stretching the point a bit, there's certainly Hong Kong, China. There is that incredibly complex bridge that swaps you over. Uh, but, uh, and I think, I, I, in fact, I'm going to Hong Kong in uh, uh, February next year for the first time. I've, I've landed at the airport before, but I've never got off the plane. So uh, I don't know what, <laughs> uh, what quite, but my brother-in-law lives there now. So we're visiting him the, the So if you did it from here, say you had a, a autonomous car, which, and I'm thinking two steps ahead, an autonomous car that doesn't have a steering wheel. It's very yeah. important to remember that. Why would it? It doesn't need one. And it's driving on, on the left-hand side of the road in this country, and it goes on to the Euro tunnel where you can drive your car onto a train. The train takes you under the sea. You come out the other side. It will know, like a bit like your sat-nav knows yeah. that uh, you're in another country. T- actually, it's interesting. Most sat-navs take about a mile of driving in France to realize you're not in England. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of catch up and they go, oh, my God, this is all weird. What's going yeah. on? <laughs> so they kind of catch up. So, uh, when you think of how relatively speaking crude sat navs are in comparison yeah. to the autonomous i don't think it's because I, I can't think of anywhere else where there is a land border between a, a left driving and right driving well in uh, countries at some point when humans are not commonly driving when maybe you know literally the the 90 percent of the cars on the road are fully autonomous no steering wheels yeah. will it will it even matter will there even be a yeah. left and right side right. you know just know where to go i mean i'll tell you yeah. what i've heard a couple of times now this year which i think is by far the most plausible and it kind of matches in with the whole notion of car of the changing nature of car ownership is uh, companies that are developing cars that that will find you. So you're walking down a street and you need to get in a car, yeah. Uh, or you're at your home, or your office, or your your place of work, or wherever, hospital, whatever. And you need a car to get to somewhere, and you get your phone out and you go blip, and the car with no one in it drives up and stops yep. in front of you, and you get in and you drive the car. Well, what that does oh. is totally, totally change the nature of all the problems with safety, with insurance, with liability. I think that I can see that happening much faster. You know, that if I had that opportunity in my lifetime to not own a car, but have access to one whenever I wanted one, and it would turn up at my door when I needed it within yeah. you know, five minutes, 
I, two, three, four, five minutes. And then when I get out of it, that's the thing that I really love. You know, then you drive to a busy city street and it's really difficult. And where are you going to park? You don't. You just get out of the car and you leave it and it drives yeah. off. And, Fantastic. You know, that, yeah. I think, I think we'll have that very soon. I mean, uh, Tesla. Gonna, yeah. Tesla already is talking about smart summon where you can go into a parking lot, click a button, it'll go park. You know, you come out of the restaurant or whatever, you click a button, it'll come. I, I think we'll see that. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, more skeptical than others. I'm thinking five years. So let's just wrap up here with uh, what else you have going on. What's next for Robert and Fully Charged and what can people look forward to? Well, we've just today, earlier today or last night for you guys, uh, launched the the fully charged Almanac 2020, which is which has already received quite a lot of contentious comments around the concept of producing a, a book about a, the, the most rapidly changing technological revolution in <laughs> the human history. Uh, but I think it is worth it. And in fact, one of the people who's um, writing for us, who's a physicist, has just says the fundamentals aren't changing. So we're, we're going, we're covering the whole gamut in the in the book of, of you know, obviously electric vehicles, but also renewable energy storage, how batteries are developing, new technologies uh, in associated with that smart grids, you know, all sort of fusion energy. We're about to go and see some fairly terrifying fusion reactors. Uh, there's quite a lot of stuff happening, and some of it as she rightly points out, is absolutely fundamental science, which would be mm -hmm. great to get to have. I need it so that when people go, well, you know, how many da da da? And I go, hang on a minute, let me get my book out. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I, but there is an ebook version of it as well. So uh, it's just that we had, we get so many requests from so many companies that are, you know, doing new systems and new. I mean, there's a company down the road in a little town near me uh, that are have i i wait to see it i'm not putting any money on it or thinking about it but they have developed a functioning solid state battery wow and, and uh they've got a lot of interest in it i mean seriously large amounts of money going into developing it and they have functioning prototypes so we're talking batteries that can be charged and discharged a million times wow and wow. with no degradation, no overheating, no heating problems, uh, 10 times the current energy density of lithium, of the best lithium ion. So, you know, real revolution in energy storage. So lighter, cheap materials, carbon. It's basically made of carbon. Wow. That's incredible. Our carbon around. <laughs> we're not going to run out of carbon. If we run out of carbon, we're in then real we're, trouble. <laughs> yeah, we're, then, we're all, then we're all done. <laughs> so, you okay. know, stuff like that. Exciting. So that's what the, the book is covering. We're carrying on making fully charged. It's exhausting, as I'm sure you are extremely aware. But, but we keep making shows. We're we're so not a, a, a breaking news channel. We're so slow at getting them out. But when they come out, they, you know, I, I'm very proud of them. I think the team are doing an amazing job. Well, I, I think so, all of us, I speak for all of us and say that, you know, we're, we're very appreciative of, of your efforts and everything you're doing here. And we, we all look forward very much to uh, the Almanac as well as, Almanac, you know, all the other yeah. funner stuff you have coming well, the out. Other, so. The other things, I mean, I, I'll mention it very briefly because it's not confirmed yet. But we, well, what is confirmed is we're doing, a, we did a, a show called Fully Charged Live this, this year, uh, which was very successful. We're definitely doing another one of those next year. We're very in advanced negotiations and arrangements to do one in your neck of the woods, but I really can't All say right. anymore. Yeah. Uh, well, in 2019. Fantastic. Well, I hope everyone uh, follows and watches and, you know, uh, we'll all be we'll all be kind of waiting to see. And, uh, you know, I'll definitely uh, make it out to one if you do one out here, of course. But uh, I would love to make one out um, in uh, in the UK because I've never oh, really yeah. other than Heathrow, I've never really been. So, yeah, you, know. <laughs> you need, to to, you need we, we need to invite you to fully charge live next year. It would be great if you were there. There's so many Teslas. I mean, that was, I'll just very briefly tell you, that was a thing that we did not expect. Somebody from the Tesla Owners Club in the UK said, do you want us to come along? We went, yes, brilliant. You know, bring your cars and people will want to see them. And uh, I think it was 62 Tesla owners drove people from the car. There's quite a long distance from the car park to the venue because of yeah. the nature of a much basic circuit. You had to kind of go around to get in. Uh, and they, one of them did 60 trips. 
Wow. <laughs> he came to see the show. He never came in. We never saw him. He came, he <laughs> drove people, dropped them off, went back, got more, drove them around for 60 times. And then he drove off to the nearest supercharger to recharge. And he came back <laughs> and he came back and had a cup of tea. And we said to him, come the, ne- to the next day and don't drive anyone. We're going to say, but of course, all the, the, the there were, you know, possibly five, six hundred people at that event who had never been in an electric car and definitely never been in a Tesla who just went bananas because, of course, the owners, the the speed limit on the motor in on the um, service roads in the motor uh, inside the racing circuit uh, is 20 miles an hour. Ah. Very, very clearly marked. And one of the Model X's was clocked at doing 103 miles an hour, <laughs> which of course we, we had to have a little chat. <laughs> with Fantastic. Three, with three kids in the back screaming, so he'd ludicrous it up the. I mean, it's a straight road. He wasn't going to yeah. hit anyone, but still, yeah, yeah, yeah. Three is a bit excessive. <laughs> but that was great. I mean, it was a, an amazing weekend. It was really phenomenal, and we're really looking forward. So this time we're doing. We've got 3,000 test drives. You know, we can c- cater for 3,000 yeah. drives, all sorts of electric, you know, every make you've ever heard of. They're all coming. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, yeah, it should be a good event. And it'd be okay. great. Um, we'll have to Le- discuss that. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot me a note. I'd love to make it. Yeah. We'll discuss that offline. Offline. As they say <laughs> in podcast land. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right, Robert. Well, thank you again. Have a good, good rest of your evening you. and um, we'll be in touch. Great stuff. All right. Thanks Cheers. very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, everyone. Thank you all for uh, working uh, with us here through that. Uh, I definitely had some internet issues here. I'm going to try to uh, patch those up a little bit while we take uh, just a a couple minute break um, in between now and the next session with Joe Scott with Answers with Joe. Um, The stream on YouTube may go offline briefly as I switch over to the next session on Crowdcast. Kind of just an unfortunate side effect there. Um, Everyone on Crowdcast, I do nothing. I will click a button and you'll magically be transported into that session, at which time you can start asking questions, which we'll get to towards the end of our talk. So um, thank you everyone for, you know, being here, hanging on. I hope you guys enjoyed that talk with Robert. I always love catching up with him uh, because he's just such a great, so knowledgeable. And of course, um, such a, just so charismatic. So uh, hang on a second and we'll be right back with the show.